Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Hi. Welcome to SPX 2024. My name is Alice Santos. I'm going to be our moderator today on our discussion of communicating science. So if you will join me in welcoming our wonderful guests, uh, Tara Bean, Sarah Furr, Jay Hosler, and Erica Johnson. Thank you. And then I'm afraid that I don't have my clicker right now. Have we? Oh, yeah. uh -huh. Amazing. See, you ask questions and you get answers. It's just like science. Good science. <laughs> so some of Kara's work. We also have some of Sarah's work. With this incredible little worm that I'm just in love with. There's Jay. And then Erica's work as well. So I really wanted to start out with this incredible panel that Erica did. I've gotten so comfortable with not knowing things. And when we think about it, that's really the basis of what science is, right? We don't know. We're going to find out the best that we can, but we don't know. And so I wanted to start out today with our incredible guest to talk a little bit about questions. When you were creating these ideas, when you were exploring, the work that you were doing, where you wanted it to do. I'd love to know what kind of questions you were asking as you were thinking about that. So uh, let's see, Sarah, do you want to start? Oh, sure. Um, so my book is called Eventually Everything Connects, Eight Essays on Uncertainty. Uh, and my book follows eight questions uh, that turn into chapters and it's an intersecting book. But my whole book is basically driven by questions. and. Somewhat unscientifically, I sort of riff off and play around with the problems in a, in a uh, multi-contextual, uh, multi-dialogue way. Um, but questions and looking at multiple answers is something that drives all of my work. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Erica, we have uh, actually one of your panels up here as well about some of the tools that, that you worked with. And yeah, I'd love to hear about what kind of questions brought you to this kind of work. Um, so this particular comic, it's called DeFries Hydraulic Laboratory, um, a scrapbook. And it was just basically like I spent, so I have a PhD. I spent so much time in the laboratory trying to earn that degree. And like I was, it, we didn't have a lot of tools. We didn't have a lot of money. And so basically I put my experiment together that led to my scientific experiments from scraps that were just lying around the lab. And it's kind of a love letter to the lab, um, which is, you know, that's, that's how I feel about science. It's, it's, it's a part of me. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of convey that affection for science in the different tools that I, and actually like I drew all of the, the specific panels from memory, just from seeing things and being in the lab every day, all day, um, running the experiments. So for this particular um, project, it's just, you know, it's a love lab, it's a love zine to the lab, mm -hmm. so. I love that, because aren't we just like kind of a little bit always in love with the work that we do? Like Absolutely. for better or for worse, <laughs> right? Like it haunts me in my dreams sometimes, but yeah. also I can't leave it alone. So Kara, how about you? Um, so I, for 13 years, was a high school art teacher, and um, mental health became a big topic uh, for me as a teacher because my students would bring their mental health to the art classroom, and I felt very um, ill-prepared. I had a lot of training in the arts, but not any training in uh, mental health. So anytime there was any kind of class, I would sit and take notes, and my notes are comics because I'm a cartoonist, and I would start drawing them. And so over, this was probably started 15 years ago, but I would start uh, drawing about mental health, and eventually uh, I was challenged to create a book that spoke directly to kids about mental health, um, because I seemed to be able to, I was trying to teach myself, and uh, in so doing so, I was uh, making it easier for others to learn. And this book that I made, uh, Here I Am, I Am Me, it is, um, explores tons of questions about mental health, and in fact, every chapter has a map of questions. And so um, I was very much driven by my own questions and seeking the answers and finding the experts to explain it to me so that I could explain it through comics. Yeah. Incredible. Jay, how about you? Um, well, I'll start mine with a short story. When I started my postdoc, 
um, and working with honeybees, I was hired because I was an expert in some sensory biology stuff. And so my boss sent me into the lab and he said, could you please set up this apparatus that you've set up for the other person? So I spent the day doing it. I could not get it to work. I could not get it to work. And I finally sort of slunked down to his lab, his office, and, and he came down and he looked at it. He says, it looks pretty good. Need to plug it in, though. <laughs> <laughs> Which is to say that most of the questions that drive me are oftentimes very simple. They're the things that I just don't know. So if I'm doing a book on a bee or a beetle, um, I need to know what its underside looks like. Uh, I just finished a panel for a dung beetle story that I'm working on, and I had this green dung beetle fly in dramatically at our protagonist. And then I sat there and realized, you know, some dung beetles are flightless. And so I got online and I looked and looked and looked. And I'm like, is this green dung beetle species that I picked? So then I, I contacted a woman named Ainsley Siago, who's at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, and said, Ainsley, could you pop open the elytra on one of your dung beetles? I'm so relieved uh, to get the word that it could fly because I'm also very lazy and I did not want to draw it again. So, um, <laughs> so the questions I ask are, are simple. They're usually in the service of the science and making sure that I'm true to it when I'm telling a narrative. And I'm constantly emailing people who are smarter than me, which is, you know, not hard, but I'm constantly contacting them just to get those little details. And what I've always found from scientists is they get really jacked up and excited mm -hmm. to know that you are tapping into their world and that they can help you tell that story in some way. Mm -hmm. I, as someone who is also a scientist, I think that's one of my favorite things is that I can always feel pretty good about reaching out to another researcher and asking the most unhinged questions. <laughs> and they're very excited to answer. I love this. I love this about our community. Wonderful. Well, so that, what we've talked about brings up a really great point is that I think there can be this perception that art and science are diametrically opposed or that they are somehow in conflict with one another. And as creators who work with these two things together, I'd love to know about sort of how you approached that, how those two things integrate together. Can you tell me more about that? Whoever feels comfortable starting. Can I time. jump in really quickly to riff off what you said? Um, <laughs> the highest compliment that I got is in one of my chapters, I'm looking at, at quantum physics, and quantum physics is really hard to visualize, and I had to take some creative license around how to visualize it, um, and I showed it to a, a quantum physicist, and he looked at it for a long time, and I thought, uh-oh, he's going to tell me I've bungled this. But he said, no, okay. Principally, this is all correct. However, you can't visualize it in that way because that, that's not formally correct. But I also understand that you need to visualize it to communicate it, so I think it's good. Um, <laughs> um, but I think that it's such an interesting tension with science comics is that getting things factually accurately correct really matters. But then you do have to have a little bit of wiggle room to creatively communicate, and, and that's a really fun problem, you know? And I think that that really drives a lot of our work because it's fun to play with the problem. Um, and to segue into your question is, um, I think that the, the kind of underlying like wonder, curiosity, not knowing and wanting to find out and also describe uh, are two things that are very much part of science and, and art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Erica, how about you? I think for me, in, in my head, it's very clear that the two are, I guess, working in conjunction with, with each other, whether or not I'm doing art, whether or not I'm doing science. When I get stuck in science, I draw pictures. And it's personally very fascinating to me that my notes from sciences almost look like a zine. Mm -hmm. um, and I was doing that before I was drawing comics. And I feel like for me personally, I'm a little bit better at perspective and drawing the form, the human form, accurately because I have such a technical background. So, I mean, there's definitely an interplay um, between the two that's, I, mean, I want to do a zine about this in the future because I think it's just so fascinating. Yeah. But like, I'm better at both because I have both. Um. I love that. Um, so the, the heaviest lift in my book was drawing about the human brain, and I needed to break down the areas of the brain, 
but the brain is such a huge topic <laughs> that no one really agrees on and it's really a mess and you can go down the rabbit hole forever. But I had to remind myself like this is for kids and I need to just like call it at a certain place. <laughs> and I was like, okay, like the amygdala looks like an almond, like we all agree, you know, and like the hippocampus is lumpy uh, seahorse. and. Um, but like, I don't know, like what the neurochemicals, I'm just going to make them diamonds, you know, like, because I, there's, I just need to make them a different shape. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of, uh, sticking to the script, but then also like really just getting your point across or making, you know, what's the bigger message. I'm, I'm not training scientists about the brain. I'm talking about mental health and I'm trying to make it approachable, but, uh, yeah, it was, that was probably the hardest part of writing and Took, like I, it took me six years to make the book, and I feel like the first five years was just figuring out the brain piece, and then I was like, okay, now I can do the rest of the book. Yeah. You know, um, from my standpoint, uh, the fact that I, I have the opportunity to teach mm -hmm. every day, um, what's clear to me is that science is a creative endeavor. Uh, no scientist walks into a lab, uh, is handed a sheet that explains them an experiment, and they win the Nobel Prize, right? <laughs> Science creates knowledge. Art creates knowledge as well, a different knowledge, an internal knowledge. Um, and the truth is, the only resistance I've ever gotten to my books has never been from scientists. Mm -hmm. It's from pretentious people who think they're scientists <laughs> and um, who will say to me, well, doesn't that dumb down? And I'm like, well, look, if you want someone to understand something and you can approach it in a medium that helps them understand something, that is not dumbing it down, that is smarting it up, right? <laughs> and, um, and the truth is that all these tensions of not saying exact, I mean, that's what teaching is. You, I tell my students in my biology, my intro biology class, I'm going to lie to you this semester because I'm going to paint a picture that's relatively simple. And then when you take my upper level neuro class, you're gonna see that it's a little more complicated than that. But we have to take those steps, I think, in order to, 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 to reach across an abyss sometimes of, of understanding. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's just so interesting to me all the time uh, to see how people from different fields relate to it. Because I've also had run-ins with those folks before and it's just like, why would you not want more people to understand? <laughs> yes. Why would you not want people to be as hyped about this as I am? Because it is so cool. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of bouncing off of that, uh, in the last few years, health literacy has risen to such, um, to such a concern mm -hmm. worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot more initiatives now towards increasing health literacy. Uh, what, what has that looked like for you? Um, because particularly when, you know, something like mental health right. um, is such an emergent issue for a lot of folks, it's important to make sure that we're communicating things accurately and that people can understand them. Yeah, um, yeah, it's been, I was scared to make this book, honestly, um, because, but I really wanted, wanted it as an educator and as just like a human that wanted this book when I was a kid. Um, mm. But... Uh, even now that the book is out, I am connecting with some schools, but I am still feeling like that stigma is pretty strong and there's a lot of fear out there. And so people are like, well, what is this book? And like, what are you, what, if you were to talk to the students, what are you gonna say to them? Like there, there's, there's fear around doing the wrong thing. And, um, but at the base, when I conceived of the book or when I was learning about mental health, the biggest piece was just, uh, allowing people to talk about it and especially like the chapter that's probably the most um intense is my is about suicide in my book but it's really important to be able to talk about suicide mm -hmm. and it actually prevent the suicide if you can release that feeling and let somebody open um and talk about it so um i knew it was super important and i um but i also know that that scares people too and mm -hmm. like um so, um, like right now, right away, like therapists are like, yes, I love this book, thank you. I'm gonna use this, it's in my office, I'm using it. Um, and like some teachers, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's finding its way, but they, I, it's not like, give it to me. I feel like I, I'm actually spending more time shepherding this book this year than I probably normally would with a book, just mm -hmm. to 
kind of guide its way and explain that it's you know there to help and how it can help and it's not there to trigger um, yeah absolutely absolutely yeah it's um, it, it's writing a fine line right where you you want to help the public understand or even just literacy in general in the sense of saying hey there's this incredible bank of knowledge out there and I'm going to help you get the key you need mm -hmm. to go as far as you want to go and then also I think uh, nature is very funny <laughs> nature is just like deeply funny um, and so it allows things like uh, the the beetle beer bottle story yeah. <laughs> which is exceptional uh, if you would not mind filling us in about this yeah episode. sure so um, the book that I've written is a is a um, comes across as a non-fiction memoir, which is kind of a Trojan horse for science. Um, and this particular chapter is about cognitive biases uh, and issues and advantages around perception that, that humans and other organisms have. Some things are similar, some things are different. Um, and I look at kind of human fallibility uh, and then also cr creature fallibility around pattern recognition. And in Australia, we have this jeweled beetle and we have a very famous beer called VB. And when this beer, the VB bottle came out, it actually caused a big issue because it looks to the jeweled beetle like a giant sexy lady jewel beetle <laughs> and people would litter with these and the male jewel beetles would just go holy smokes look at that sexy lady and would all crawl over them and mate with them till death and it was actually causing the beetle to go extinct um and so what a way to go, what a way to go doing what they loved um but so they had to change the design of the beetle to, so now it's just a smooth brown bottle before it was dimpled and glossy. Um, uh, but, but so I use things like this because a lot of people are not that interested in beetles. And I'm like, come on guys, this is fascinating. But I use this as a kind of mirror or reflection to our own um, fallibilities and um, what's it called? Hyper, or oh, what's it called? Hypers, when people eat junk food and look at sexy things on the internet, does anyone remember what that's called? It's called hyper, hyper normal stimulation. I can't remember. Oh, sorry. I feel like that's right. <laughs> sorry, I, I just came from Australia on a 30 hour flight, so my brain's a little wobbly. But yeah, basically, that we get hijacked by like hyper pleasurable things, just like beetles do. And that, that you know, we need to exercise a level of caution, just like the beetles. Anyway. <laughs> so it's interesting because you mentioned mirror uh, with nature. And what's, you know, my books are technically fiction right layered with a lot of natural history but i had a a, um, a children's librarian once tell me that the best stories have two major components a mirror the thing that reflects back to us and then the window the the, the ability to look into a different world so like i always point out with with the honeybees for example uh they're a family they live together they work together those things the hive is but uh so that's your mirror and then you know, like the, the window is the fact that, you know, they, they live in a house of their own bodily secretions, right? <laughs> so they're secreting wax, they gnaw it up. And I tell my students, I just want you to think about this when you get married <laughs> and you would have to start digging the ear out and saving up <laughs> for a house, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you don't have to move it that far away. <laughs> Hi, babe. Um, that's that when you talk about money is that is the ability to say okay here's how they're like you and here's how they're different mm -hmm. and um, I think it's really a powerful mechanism there's there's all this evidence that says laughing when you're learning is really really useful mm -hmm. yeah it's it's so powerful to see a depiction of the kind of passion that follows us along with things like that and so many scientists are, you know, they devote their entire lives to this work. It sort of infuses everything that we do. And so, for example, Erica, even seeing like your procedural type comics, mm -hmm. where talking about just sort of the nuts and, and bolts of it, uh, is such an incredible narrative through just what it feels like mm -hmm. day to day. Um, I'd love to hear more about the narrative itself and how working with those narratives has shown up in your work um, or not 
shown up in your work in the, in that regard. So, so I, I really echo with what you're saying about the whole mirror and the window because that is basically how I got into science in the first place. It was Jordy LaForge, oh, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, and it was <laughs> seeing him as a mirror, as a, you know, a black guy doing technical stuff. I sat there and I was like, okay, I want to be an astronaut. How am I going to be an astronaut? I'm going to be Jordy. And so I got my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering thanks to LeVar Burton, so shout out to him. Um, but it was just, you know, it was seeing him as an example, but then also, you know, getting, in, getting the idea of what it might be like to work and live in space. Fast forward, I didn't quite become an astronaut, I did apply, um, but I became an oceanographer. And now I'm out over the ocean in a small plane taking pictures of the ocean. And so, you know, I got close. I give myself full credit for that. I got pretty close. But mostly in my comics, I don't, the science does show up, but I'm not majoring in telling people about the science. I, my personal philosophy with my comics is, I'm just gonna talk about what I do and what my day-to-day -day looks like because how many people know what an oceanographer does on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so I just, I focus on what my experiences are like, like the things that I care about, what I'm doing, like what does my day to day look like? It's mostly coding. <laughs> it's almost always coding and then talking sometimes with difficult colleagues. <laughs> There's a little bit of that too. Um, um, so, I mean, I mostly just focus on these are my experiences and I feel like if I am excited and if that comes across on the page, then maybe somebody else will get excited about you know going into the sciences. Amazing. Um, I'll, I'll just say an interesting thing happened to me when I was making this book, and I feel like when you make a book, um, the book starts coming up with rules about what it's supposed to be, and mm -hmm. you're just like, okay. Um, and I was really struggling for a long time trying to find the voice and like how to talk, and I actually split up into two uh, narrators or, or parts. And so one is the narrator that is like your adult that has information is like, no, there's no, they're just the voice at the top of the panel. Um, and then the bean, my last name is bean and I draw this little bean character. And the bean is like your friend and is making mistakes and is, has problems and um, doesn't know things and is more like me. Um, and so I kind of talk to you from two voices at once. Mm -hmm. And that took me a while to even know that I was doing it. And then once I did it, I had to go back and like re-edit the book and change places where the bean was talking like an adult and the, you know, the voice was being silly. It was like I had to um, parse that all out. But it came as a result of trying to uh, get my point across, but also not like bore you. And yeah. So. yeah I think there's actually evidence like that 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 approach mm -hmm. where you have one character who's new to something and asking a question, there's evidence that su suggests that we learn pretty effectively when we first hear what something is not. Mm -hmm. So those type of characters can oftentimes say, you know, something kind of goofy that we might be thinking yeah. that the, 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 the older narrator can sort of explain away. But mm -hmm. by having that juxtaposition of it's not this, but it's this, you actually wind up not only generating a strong narrative component, mm -hmm. right? That tension of what is right, what is wrong, but also two illustrations in one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Sarah, did you wanna add anything? I think here? everyone said it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've loved how uh, the, the different sort of forms of narrative have worked their, their way through because your book is all about the interconnectedness of everything and that includes the stories that we tell and who is telling them. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a formal element of my book is I use, I think it's called intertextual. So I have lots of different voices talking uh, and different, you know, conflicting opinions as well because I feel like that's an important part of science is, you know, uh, going back to science literacy, a lot of people will say, oh, science says green tea is good to drink. And it's like, if you actually look into it, it's like, you know, the jury is not out. It's like with coffee, you know, there's camp coffee and there's camp no coffee, you know, and um, so for me, it's interesting to play with the problem and have sort of pros, cons to, to kind of shape out the complexity of, you know, it kind of leans, you know, probability wise, it's more this direction, but it's still not, you know, fully set. And I think that that kind of, um, 
protosynthesis position mm -hmm. is such an important part of science and living in such a hyper complex world with many, you know, interconnecting problems, um, it's good to have this yeah, protosynthesis position where, you know, I'm over here, but it could move this way and just not being completely uh, nailed to any particular thing, I think, is a, is a difficult position to have, but it's a good practice to develop, and that's what I've tried to do in my book. And also, exactly to what you're saying, it's nice to have different voices, because as a reader, you might relate more to this voice or that voice, mm -hmm. um, and, you can, and having more voices, you can kind of move between, like, as a dialectic, or I don't know what you call it when you have more voices. Uh, yeah. I also just remembered the, the word um, that I was looking for before is called um, hypernormal stimulation. Oh, oh I yeah, like that. yeah. We were close. Yeah, anyway, yeah. <laughs> we were close. It was fine. Great. Uh, so I think at this point, we'd like to open things up for a few questions uh, if folks have them. If you do have any, um, feel free to either raise your hand or step over to one of the mics that we have available. Thanks. Yes. Or does someone raise yeah, go ahead, okay. and then we do have someone who raised uh, their hand, if we could pass okay, the mic great. off. So. Hi. Um, Hi. It's Hello. been really neat to hear your perspectives. Um, I'm a neuroscientist, so it's particularly interesting to hear like, how you're sort of visualizing the brain. Mm -hmm. And I was curious um, how some of, it seemed like most of you went based on your personal experiences into particular areas of science, but I was curious if you're reaching out directly to scientists who are kind of receptive to this way of communicating, because I'd say like generally as a field, we kind of struggle with that and um, even to each other, I would say. Uh, we're kind of stuck in old ways of even like how we publish our work. And so uh, I think, you know, interacting with artists more would benefit the field greatly, but I'm guessing probably a lot of people sort of shrug it off. So I was curious if like you've reached out directly to people in other areas that you've been interested in and how that's been for you. I, I can speak to it. Um, so with the brain chapter, I did have a neuroscientist uh, pal that I would send it off to. And um, they were like, yeah, you're talking about neurons, but you haven't mentioned glial cells at all. And I was like, what are glial cells? <laughs> I can learn that. Because uh, yeah, I'm really, I think like it, I, it probably kind of a backwards way of creating something, but I think it kind of works being the artist taking a whack at it, sending it off to the scientist. Scientist gives you notes, but it, I get to maintain my wacky self, you know, um, and there isn't like so much like, make sure you mention this, 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 because you have to narrow it down. Um, so I think, that, I think there's a lot of possibility for collaboration and um, there's a field, it's called graphic medicine. Mm -hmm. They just had a conference in Ireland. <laughs> And um, they are, well, there were some beautiful examples of scientists and doctors pairing up with artists and creating things. So I feel like, you know, let's get some grants and like pay people and make this happen. I think there's, yeah, yeah there's so much space for this. Yeah. So we're going to, I'm going to be part of a workshop at the Entomological Society of America. So I was trained as an insect neuroscientist. And so, um, but the whole thrust of it is for us to help scientists take their work and turn it into a one or two page, essentially um, a graphic abstract. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting is there are a number of journals now that are, and you've probably seen this, right? Um, uh, that have graphic abstracts at the beginning that sort of have a figure. And I think um, there's an increasing interest by scientists and, and in large part because it's a generational. All the old farts who thought this was bad are dead. And, <laughs> and the young people who grew up with visual media and understand its impact are much more receptive to it. Yeah. yeah. Well, just as one quick follow-up, I wanted to just plant this idea in your heads of, I think a Congress might be much more likely to adopt science if it were comics. So if you ever feel like, you know, maybe there's something you can do in that public facing side because um, I think scientists are like really struggle with that and completely go through words and I think maybe there'd be more adoption of some of these like ideas that are really pivotal um, if they were visual so thank you so much for what you do thank you uh, actually if you wouldn't mind handing the microphone to this person in the pink mask here with the white sweater they have their hand up oh, oh my God. thank you so much Thank you. 
Hi there. Um, I was curious about like laboratories and experiments and kind of breaking down that subject matter as an artist without like a scientific background. Like, should artists be trying to shadow scientists to make you know these um, depictions of real scientists more authentic? And how can we do that, especially because the scientific community is very like internal in the sense that um, the labs are closed off and the research is usually like not always publicly published. So like, how does an artist kind of break into that world? besides just going to museums or libraries to figure it out? That's a good question. I mean, if, if I were, well, I guess I am an artist. Um, <laughs> if, if I were an artist who is also not a scientist, I, would, I might consider like conferences, like going to conferences and meeting, they're expensive, unfortunately, but that would be a great pe pe a place to talk, to talk to scientists um, and kind of get your foot in the door, so to speak. Also, journals are also expensive. Um, but usually there are pictures of scientific equipment in the journals. Like if you were to, I don't know, whatever field that you're particularly interested in, you could go to that journal, see who's doing what, um, kind of get a broad overview of what those scientists are doing and maybe get your, I mean, their email addresses are in there where they work. That information is also in the journal. That would be off the top of my head how I might start. I mean, scientists are easily flatters. So if you said, hey, I saw your paper on the website and it was so good, I wonder if I could talk to you and could you invite me to your lab? And you know, then you could go and like, take pictures and sort of start a, and develop a relationship that way. I mean, if you look at most of the really good science journalists, they interview people all the time. And usually they interview them and they go visit them. Yes. So I think that I think the, the nature, the proprietary nature of some research labs uh, tends to be, uh, you know, industrial. But if you're looking for an academic, academics want tenure. Uh, I'm, I'm not kidding. It's they true. want tenure. It's very true. And if they, if, if there's an opportunity to put their work out there in any kind of public way, they're usually super duper receptive to that. Plus, it, it allows them to justify the tedium of their lives, right? <laughs> because, it, I mean, that's what science is. Science is picking the tedium that you love. I mean, right? it's true. Uh, it's I, true. I, I trained honeybees for hours and hours. It is terribly boring, but I love it. And so having an opportunity to, to share the wonder mm -hmm. of that, I think most scientists, especially in an academic situation, would be more than receptive. The flattery helps. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I like that a lot. It's you choose the tedium you love. Because yeah. yeah, there are times where I try to describe my work to people, and they're like, "I, why? <laughs> <laughs> all, really? All this all the time? Yeah, I get it. Uh, let's go to the person in the green mask over here." <laughs> Um, I'm going to chime in. So, like, mm, part of what I'm interested in, what I write about, is kind of the philosophy of science, and I find it consistently interesting how different sciences have completely kind of different uh, groundworks, and, and there is real tension there between the different sciences, but I also feel like we are in a time where the different silos need to, you know, work with each other and find common ground and it's messy and it's complicated and there is a lot of disagreement but I don't think there's any way forward other than to find um, you know new new and old ways to talk about you know how to be better custodians how to better understand you know the complexity science that kind of joins everything together um, and then there are you know uncomfortable trade-offs and there are um, cultural biases that need to be seriously questioned and it's just messy uh, and will continue <laughs> but yeah. uh, the thing about science is is it's done by humans 
And science as a, a discipline is full of all the same human foibles as any other discipline, mm. including arrogance, right? And including thinking you know a lot about something when you've only scratched the surface. I mean, there's a reason why uh, I have a couple physicist friends who roll their eyes at ecology, right? <laughs> because it's a lot messier, right? I can drop a ball 10 times and I'm gonna get 9.8 meters per second squared for grabbing in a certain area. But, you can go in an ecosystem and it looks one way one day and one day the next, right? So I think that the tension sometimes is this desire for a simple answer and uh, this idea that you can fix one thing, that I can put, you know, a mosquito that can't mate and what harm could it do in the environment except that it removes some major food for a bird, right? And that sort of, that sort of as you said, the silos, if you're working in those silos, then you can make those mistakes. But the minute you start tearing those down, and I think that comics can play a role in that. I mean, I can learn stuff about physics from a comic. Um, and so those, those elements of cross-talking, I think, are really important right now. Thank you. So we have time for one more question. I think we're going to bounce back over to this side. Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, the question I have is actually kind of about the readership aspect. So I was thinking about, um, you're talking a lot about science communication from your perspective, which is good, uh, but communication is a two-way street. So when people are reading, uh, sometimes there can be miscommunications and things like that. And I was wondering if you had any advice for the readership and for the community of people who talk about your works. Uh, on how to better engage with the topics fully, I guess. Well, I think that um, you know anyone who's a, a writer, uh, you're, you're writing for an audience, so there's always this com communication, and um, you know books unfortunately are static, so you know you will make mistakes, and so I think that the the thing is to listen to readership and listen to um, feedback, I guess, and then you you know build that in with the next iteration of what you do, and it's a kind of evolving thing. Um, and I think, yeah, just leaving room for mistakes and feedback is an important part of the work. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just to clarify, I more meant, like, from our perspective, like, uh, is there things that we can do to better engage with the work? Oh. So at the back of all my books, I put annotations. Mm. Uh, and I, because, the thing about telling uh, the stories like I do, my first draft is always um, elephantine, right? And it's packed with all cool stuff that I want to say. <laughs> but I can't say all that cool stuff. I've got to extract some of that for the, the flow of the narrative. Um, because what I am trying to do more than anything else is to inspire wonder, right? So the first bit is, can I get you to wonder? Can I get you to awe? Can I get you to, ooh, that's cool. Ah, now if I got you there, at the back of the book, there's all the boring extra stuff, <laughs> right? There's the stuff that, oh, I really wish he'd talk more about that flying green dung beetle. Oh, I did. <laughs> it's right back here in the back. And so I think that, that what everyone in this panel tries to do is, is to inspire that wonder, that interest. And then the job of the reader is to pursue it. I mean, yeah. most of you have more computing power in your back pocket right now than they had for the Apollo missions. So yeah. you can Google it, right? You can actually look things up. Yeah. Yeah, I guess for my, for my book, I really want it to, I love people just pass it on to the next person. You know, mm -hmm. like, oh, this helped, you know, here, oh, you're going through something, or your sister's going through something, here, here here's a book you can have. I like the idea of it just moving through yeah communities and uh, connecting like that, I feel like is really exciting when that can happen. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. All right, folks, well, thank you. I, I'd love to take a couple of minutes and just talk about our wonderful panelists, what they're up to next, uh, where we can find them while we are here at SPX, if I can find the correct slide. Okay. 
So here I am. I am me. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so this, yeah, this is this book came out April um, 2024. It's still finding its way in this world, mm -hmm. uh, making friends. And um, I'm I'm upstairs at table I. I'm at the I section, and I'm number 10A. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and um, and tomorrow, if any of you like to draw, I'm teaching a um, mindful drawing. I'm an art teacher. That's where my expertise. I'm I'm a explainer here, but really, what I love to do is draw with people. So I'll be drawing at four o'clock downstairs. Yeah, here. Great, thank you. Eventually, everything connects. Let's. Uh... Oh. Amazing, thank you. Da, 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 da. Um, so I am at the Graphic Mundi table, which is E1 and 2. Um, and I'm in the US on book tour of the East Coast, um, so I'll be going around the place with this book. Um, I'm doing a signing after this from 2.15 to 3.15 at E1 and 2, and I'll also be doing a signing tomorrow from 2 till 3. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so this is Ant Story. This is the latest. This is a story about a cartoon ant named Ruby who finds herself, well, was born into a colony of real leafcutter ants. She has nobody to talk to until she meets an ant that she can talk to. And that ant has a secret. And now I'm going to spoil it. No, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Uh, but, but the story is about Ruby telling stories, and of course, that's my vehicle for explaining stuff about ants uh, and their world. It's up for a Harvey, so I'm kind of excited about that. Yay. It's nice to be noticed, I'm just going to say. <laughs> um, I am at table B8, and I've got everything that I think I've ever done. Is that right, Dare? Just about. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> Um, and I have a couple of mini comics at my table. I'm at C11. The uncomfortable certain or comfortable uncertainty is a work that I've uh, drawn just about how I've had to just be comfortable with not knowing things. And I also have my seasick oceanographer comic at my table this weekend because I also get seasickness as an oceanographer. <laughs> and how do I deal with that? Well, that comic talks about it. So I have a, a number of those at table C11. Great. Thank you. Well, yeah, thank you so much to our incredible panelists for joining us. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you to you for joining us with this. I invite you to uh, take a photo of contact information if you would like to stay in touch with the creators. Uh, so thank you so much for everyone for joining us. Um, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you.